Well, let's go ahead and get started then. Uh, so it is 6.59 and I'll call the meeting to order. Uh, and I am very pleased to start by welcoming our new board member, Kimberly. Welcome, pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Yeah, would you mind uh, just giving us like a 30 second uh, kind of background on who you are and what compelled you to join? Sure, my name is Kimberly Stranga. You can call me Kim. Um, I've been a part of the Longmont community for almost 17 years. Um, I live here with my husband and my two daughters. I have a sophomore at Longmont High and an eighth grader at Westview. Um, so we're definitely part of the community, love living in Longmont. And um, professionally, I'm a public health nurse. And so I feel like the work that um, the advisory board is a part of and promotes really feeds back into the needs that I see for so many families um, and supports the, the work that I do. So I wanted to get involved. Terrific, thank you so much. And thank you for your work in public health. <laughs> We're thank grateful. You. Hopefully the rest of this year will be a little smoother than, than last year for you. Hoping so. I got my COVID vaccine today, so we're headed nice. in the right direction. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, give me a call when you, you know, get to that point where you're like, it's time to close the clinic, but uh, we got some extras left and we don't want to waste them. <laughs> I'll keep you in mind. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Not necessary though. Um, and let's see, uh, Sandra, welcome. Good to see you again. And we have Molly, I know, waiting. So Molly, nice to see you as well. Uh, do we have, Nicole, is there any public that's waiting? No, sir, no public. Okay, terrific. Then let's go ahead and uh, the minutes were distributed in advance of the meeting, the minutes from our December meeting both it's December 10th and December 22nd. So I would ask if there is a motion to approve the December 10th and December 22nd minute meetings. Caitlin, so moves, is there a second? Deanna is the second on that. You'll have to arm wrestle with Graham, but I think Deanna was first on that one. <laughs> And any discussion, any questions, uh, content you feel needs to be corrected? Okay, then all in favor, please raise your hand if you are on video. And I suppose speak up if you're not, but we, I think everybody's on video from the board. Okay, terrific. Okay, the minutes are approved. Our next and perhaps most important piece of <laughs> business uh, for the entire year really is designating the 2021 Housing and Human Services Advisory Board meetings posting location. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> so. <laughs> so, um, Brian, may I add a comment about of course. this important item? Yes. <laughs> so, um, and so I think for uh, Kimberly's um, benefit, this, this really is a requirement by Colorado Open Meetings Law that we do this uh, you know, every year at our first meeting of the year. And, and my understanding, and Nicole, you can add to this, is that, is that what is being recommended, so it's a little different, Brian, it's a different strategy, mm -hmm. is that the online, you know, we have our online portal for all of our advisory boards. And so our, the recommendation, I think, from our city attorney is that, that we make sure that that is our um, official posting place. And then we could also have um, a physical posting place as we have in the past, which has been in the, um, the west entrance of the Longmont Civic Center. Did I get that correct, Nicole? want to do Brian is we want to make the the formal the formal posting place the web okay. and with a backup posting place which I will post in both locations yeah. as the correct me if I'm wrong because I stink at directions the west, west. entrance mm -hmm. to the civic center so really it's the website is going to be our formal and I see Polly has her hand up so I think there's probably some good information there <laughs> yeah okay thank you council member Christensen 
Um, just to clarify, this was a change in state law um, allowing the the uh, use of the web as the as a possibility. So, pretty much all of our departments, including city council, are making that. But we're also using a backup because mm -hmm. a lot of people actually don't have computers or right. access right. to the web. So, anyway. Great. Thank you for that. Um, so the proposed location is the primary location is the website, the city website, and the secondary location is the west entrance to the municipal building. Uh, is there a motion to approve those two locations with the online being the primary? Well, where's all the enthusiasm that happened in a few <laughs> minutes? I mean, come on. All right, Caitlin uh, makes the motion and Deanna seconds. And any discussion on that? All right, well, I, for my part, I'm glad to see some of the government entities moving forward into the mid 20th century and <laughs> recognizing online as being a real thing. Uh, but also I do recognize the value in having that physical posting, although I typically don't know that I've ever seen it. Uh, okay, so all in favor, please raise your hand, signify I by raising your hand. Got it, Nicole, great. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the motion passes. And the meeting postings will happen online and at the West entrance. Okay, now we're getting into the meat of the matter. So we're gonna quickly move on to the uh, Human Service Agency funding recommendations. Eliberto and Karen are gonna take this and I do have a conflict. So at some point I will recuse myself and uh, Karen or Eliberto, I assume you will tell, you know, give the signal when that happens and then Nicole, you'll put me in the waiting room. Yes, just somebody let me know so I don't mess it up, okay? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, okay, guys. I'll give the floor to Karen and Eliberto. Eliberto, it's yours. <laughs> I was just waiting on, well, who's, <laughs> who's taking the lead on this one? Um, well, thank you, Chair. Um, so just to, to recap, we've had multiple conversations on this um, piece, and um, I just wanted to quickly go over two changes. Uh, one was directed by the board, and one, uh, as Karen wrote in her email, I discovered as I was finalizing um, the numbers. Um, so as directed by the board, uh, if you all have that PDF in front of you, um, I had to find a way to redistribute the $68,000 and eight or $68,008 that was uh, left over when the board chose that specific matrix. And so I didn't put all my calculations in there, but I, I do want to give you just a quick brief what, what how I made the decisions I made. Um, to it. So basically at that time, what we had was that health and well-being had 74% uh, of, it, it, it had, had been allotted or allocated 74% of the area allocation that the board had voted on previously and safety and justice had 50%. And so I've, I wanted to try and get that more equitable or more on par. And so what I ended up doing um, with the 21,758 that was left over when the board had asked to fully fund the housing stability agencies, we had $21,758 left to allocate. I broke that up 60% to safety and justice and 40% to health and well being. Um, that, was, that was a decision. I could have gone 75, 25, but I chose 60, 40. Um, and what that did 
was that that brought um, it did it did increase. So what it ended up doing was that uh, safety and justice got thirteen thousand fifty five, and health and well building got eight thousand seven hundred three, and it moved health and well being. Uh, closer to its area allocation um, of 80 uh, to 80% of it, and it moved safety and justice to 65. So it went up 15 points for uh, for safety and justice, and it went up um, six points for for uh, health and well-being. So that was the first added uh, dollars because of what the choice made. And then then was my uh, my discovery that an agency had, when you combine both programs, had received more than what the actual limit in the area was. And so I had to figure out a way how to address that. And so I, I, I won't go too much because there's a lot in the memo that, that, that Karen sent out and you have questions about the memo, but I basically described my process, what I looked at. I looked at scores and I looked at percentage of uh, allocation, which program it had, and I then, um, then I distributed that way. I made that choice that we're going to distribute it based on the percentage because the scores were left the agency at the fifty percent mark anyway, so it didn't really make that huge of a difference. Even though there was a difference in the scores, but it didn't make that much of a difference. So then that's how I chose to um, to allocate those dollars, and then that gets us to our 877455 uh, amount. And it's in the memo, I think, I'm pretty sure that it tells us, um, I'm looking that up right now. Um, it tells us um, that now we're even closer to them meeting their, um, and I didn't put percentages, so my apologies, but you can see in that last paragraph how much closer health and well-being is to its is, is how, how much is underspent. Um, and we, we, uh, we've again moved inch closer to get, get them to parity with the um, area allocation that the board had decided on when we, when we uh, first created, um, when we first did their priorities. So are there any questions about how I got to these numbers? Any questions for Eliberto? Uh, real quick, sorry, Karen, for Kim's benefit, did you cover the, this process in the orientation, I presume? We did, we did. Yeah. It was, it was fast, but you know, but Kim read the whole notebook. I'm just saying. What? It's a, it's, Can you it's share definitely. what's in it with me? <laughs> <laughs> it's good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think, but. I think maybe before we continue on further with the discussion, it's probably time for Brian to go to the room um, and, and have uh, Caitlin take over mm -hmm. the, um, the, the, the facilitation of the yeah. this part of the meeting. If I may just make one comment on the general process, um, not related to any of the mm -hmm. specific changes. We did talk, uh, Karen and I briefly about after the we vote we you know we gave direction on how to pursue the model and one of the things that came up was we chose as a board to go with the version that had the most funding left over to be redistributed where there was a pretty large there was a 65,000 some dollar gap versus the version on the other end that had very little to be redistrib redistributed but it would be taking away from a few agencies and I think for the next time we go through this, because the framework is a living dynamic framework and it adjusts in time to immediate circumstances, but also will adjust it over time just to improve as we go along. Um, that's just something to think about that maybe the, the one that had the closest, was closest to the target had the higher fidelity to the intention of the model, the greater fidelity. However, I, you know, I felt that the recognition that housing 
was such a critical issue this year and required, we really wanted to make sure it got as much support as possible. Going the other way allowed us to, to do that. Um, so that is just simply an observation that for next year, we should keep that dynamic in mind as we have that discussion in terms of which of these is closest to the intended outcome of the model. Caitlin? Yeah, I wanted to add a general comment to while you're here, Brian, um, is uh, because I've been thinking, this has kind of been rolling in my head for a little bit. One thing I left um, our meeting thinking about was that um, some of the way that we do our scoring, it basically scores an agency that's requesting a couple thousand dollars in the same way that we score an agency that's requesting $150,000. Mm -hmm. um, and our determination of yes, no, or like what percentage of funding they get is identical for those two things. But I think that like the risk to sit the city's money in those two cases is very different, right? Like giving an agency that is um, not well established, that doesn't have lots of internal controls $150,000 is much different than giving, you know, a new initiative in the city a couple thousand dollars to see if they can make any progress. And so that's one thing that I would like us, like, I don't want to change what we've done, but it's something that um, I think would be worth us thinking about the next round we do, to think about whether we want to do something, some, some scale. I don't know what makes sense right now. I, we have a while to think about it, but I'd love to see what maybe other places consider with that because um, I'm just thinking about some of the things where someone came up with a really novel thing, but they're brand new and they maybe need a little help from the city to try to get it going and giving, you know, 1500, a couple thousand dollars is not that, you know, it's not as concerning as if they had come in asking for a hundred thousand um, yeah. dollars yeah. and, and supporting the sort of, uh, diversifying our, our agencies um, is something that we might want to consider as part of what we're trying to do. I think our, our individual agency limit is one way we do that, but it's not the only way we have to do that. Yeah, Th that's a good point. And I know other organizations that I've participated with who fund money will occasionally have kind of what would be considered more a high risk set aside. So X percentage of the funding will be held for those agents, like something that uniquely meets the needs but doesn't have some of the history, doesn't have some of the structure, et cetera. So I think that's certainly something worth considering for our next round. Any other comments that that provoked before we move on and I drop and sent to the waiting room? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I think I think I just want to briefly challenge the notion that fidelity to the model is the highest good here. I think that, um, you know, the model is an important tool to achieve, uh, you know, a level of objectivity. But but I think that, um, you know, like any tool, it shouldn't uh, sort of rule our decisions. I think that if we find it's not useful, we should be able to put it down and pick up something else. So. We can talk about it next year, but that's just two cents. So. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, and you're right. I think to me, what it, what it typically suggests is if we're not getting the outcomes we want with that fidelity, is it because the model's not quite structured properly? Um, so, uh, but yeah, excellent point. And in fact, I feel like the outcome this year was an example of what you're talking about. Agreed, yep. Caitlin? Um, before you leave, Chair, um, one thing I wanted to ask is if it makes sense to talk about the initial reallocation that we had talked about the last time that's not specific to those extra agency funds. Like, does it make sense to bifurcate that conversation so that you can participate in what we had direct, like the, I think we had, the, we had extra funds left over after the model yeah. that we need to reallocate to two areas. Um, that are so discussing the decisions that Aliberto, Aliberto made with the 21,000 first. Yes. Do you, Karen, do you foresee any conflict in doing that and then having the next part, the discussion where I would leave being specifically about those extra? Probably not, but I think the sooner you leave, probably the better, if you know what I mean. I don't mean that, you, you know. talking to my wife? I mean, come yeah. on. <laughs> I just think 
bugging out um, as we are continuing these final, um, okay. it, you know, unless you have something specifically that you want to no, say. No, no, it's all of these decisions are in good hands. Yeah, so I think it's so. time to go to the room and um, and then uh, Caitlin, if you would help uh, facilitate as vice chair, that would be great. Not a problem. I see that Brian has now entered the waiting room. He's gone to the room. <laughs> I really want to get music. I wish I was more techy because I totally get music like dun dun dun. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, and Brian's going the room, Kimberly, because uh, uh, he is he has a conflict with conflict of interest, or he one of his, his agency he runs is in the running for funding. So. Yes. And the topic of the memo that yes. uh, Eliberto sent out about an agency hitting the the, the maximum okay. funding level um, for the area they were in. So um, I just I just want to quickly want to apologize because I didn't see that right away, and so I'm happy I caught it, but I wish I would have seen it at first. So my apologies for that, board. Thank you. Um, are there any questions or comments that folks have about? Um, the way the additional funds have been allocated between the different um, impact areas as well as the, the agencies. Um, one question I had, Eliberto, is mm -hmm. um, is understanding it. I, what it looks like to me is that you pretty much took those extra funds and divided them fairly evenly, but I'm not, I, I not, not fair. 60, 60, 40, 60, 40. So it was 60 percent housing stability. No, 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 no. Housing stability the board decided to just fully fund it. Oh, okay. That was the decision. The only, the only ones that I actually did any type of ratio was the 21758 that was left over after I fully funded the housing stability, uh, section. Got it. And you split it between the two and then within the category, split it evenly between agencies that weren't. No, uh, the board had said to, to take scores into consideration. So okay. the higher scores received, I divided it. I I, uh, I looked at the scores and I did, the ones with the higher scores were were made, got a little more. And then, I, then the rest I divided evenly. Okay. Are there any other any questions or points of clarification around that from anyone? Okay. Um, any any comments or conversation we need to have about the recommendation for um, Boulder County, the additional funds that we had initially allocated for Boulder County Farmers Market, um, and the reallocation of those funds. Okay, seeing none, um, is there a motion to um, accept the staff recommendation for this reallocation of funds? Um, motion to approve. Motion to approve. Is there a second? Deanna, okay. Um, any discussion about the vote? Seeing none, all in favor of approving staff recommendations for additional funding? Please raise your hand. Okay, all opposed. And, okay. and Nicole, you want to acknowledge one abstention. Okay, then I think we are done with the- And, and Caitlin, yes. what I would suggest is, again, with Brian still in the room, um, that you you make a, a motion to you know to adopt the full slate of funding recommendations for 2021. Well, he's not here. You said correct. Okay. Um, are there any other questions um, or discussion about the full slate of funding? Seeing none, do we have a motion to approve the full slate of funding recommendations to council? Okay. Uh, Karen has so moved. Do I have a second? Shakita, okay, all in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, looks like we're unanimous without okay. Brian. Um, and Brian is, has abstained from, from this. So 
Um, I think that concludes the business that he may not be in the room for. And, and he can be back in the room, but I'd like to make a statement to the board. Sure. Want me to bring Brian back in, Eliberto? I'm fine with that. Okay. Everybody okay? Yeah. Okay. I'm bringing him I back don't know in. What, I don't know what Eliberto is going to say. I know, right? <laughs> I'm like, ooh. So I think I'm okay. <laughs> Exciting. Okay. Here he comes, guys. And you're back, Chair. Welcome back. I, I just told the board, I just wanted to make a quick statement to the board before we go on to the next business. Um, and what I, I want to say, I, I, all I, all I want to say is thank you. This has been a, um, a challenging um, uh, process, not only because of the delay due to pandemics and the challenges with hearings. Um, I really have appreciated the very thoughtful conversations around the model. Um, and I look forward to having even more conversations and, and, and being uh, and, and very and very willing uh, to look at other models and think about what best serves our community members with this funding. So I just wanted to give my formal thanks to the board for the work that you have done um, and, and, and the guidance and direction that you have provided. So that's it. Am I back in the game or am I still supposed to? That was you're, a, you're back in the game. Mr. That was Chair. super short. Okay, Deanna. Um, I guess I, I don't want to derail the conversation and, and Bogart Eliberto's lovely statement, but I also just wanted to echo that as a, for my first year on the board that staff has been phenomenal and I just wanted to really express thanks for guiding me through this process because I really had no idea what I was getting into and um, I would not have had such an easy time with this were it not for staff. So really just thank you very, very much for all of your hard work. It's huge benefit to our community and I appreciate you very, very much. Thank you, Deanna. And thank you as well, uh, Ellie Bert. So, Caitlin. Yeah, I, I just wanted to echo what Deanna said. I, I really appreciate um, staff's dedication to helping make sure that this process goes forward, um, but also willingness to listen and hear various viewpoints. I know sometimes it can be like, oh my gosh, like board members aren't as close to some of this as we are. And I really appreciate your patience in explaining and helping us better understand it, but also being willing to see, you know, how we can improve it for the community. Um, I think that it's a reflection of how incredible the staff is for the city that you all um, continue to do this year after year um, and help us um, improve it each time. Yeah, thank you, Caitlin. I echo that. You guys are awesome. You know how I feel about you. You definitely patient with me. That's for sure. I appreciate it. I don't know what Deanna talking about easy. It wasn't easy for me, but I'm here. <laughs> and, and we're glad, Shakita. <laughs> Same with me. Ditto. Ditto all that. So thank you. Great. Great. It, it does feel like it's been a, a nice, healthy level of board activity and engagement and um I'm glad that we've had so much support from the staff to really make that productive. Karen. So the, um, so the only thing that I'll add to kind of put a bow on this is that we will make these, present, these um, recommendations to city council at the January 26th meeting. So, um, so we'll be doing some um, Eliberto's been working on the council communication. Um, you know, we'll load in this final, the final set of recommendations, and we'll do a final review over the weekend, and um, and then we'll send that out to you, so you'll have that. Um, but the 26th of January will be our our presentation of those recommendations. FYI. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, okay, terrific. And I just want to make sure I'm looking at the correct agenda here. So there we go. Um, so we, are we ready to move on to our next agenda item? Great, thank you. Uh, so let's move on to the TRG recommendation for the additional funding for the Cinnamon Park project. Kathy, will you introduce that? Yep. So um, this project came in outside of the process to a certain extent. They, um, the last time we opened up the application, cycle back in 2020, 
October, November, I can't remember exactly when, um, they didn't have a good handle um, yet on the changes to their financials. So when they did, they came in and um, we agreed that they should be um, considered outside of our normal process. So that's why you're seeing this a little bit differently than, um, <clears throat> than normal. Um, so I will ask Molly to just kind of summarize what has happened and um, TRG met really quickly. Thank you TRG for hopping right on this and um, reviewing and giving a recommendation so that we could give this to you at your regular meeting and then hopefully have a recommendation to take to council again at the January 26th meeting so that they get an answer as quickly as possible um, if, if, if the recommendation is to move forward. So uh, Molly, you wanna summarize for us? Sure. So they've requested an additional $250,000 for their Cinnamon Park or project, which will have um, 25 senior apartments. So they did receive um, an award in 2019, also for $250,000. Um, and part of the, the reason for the request is the increase in construction costs especially um, in lumber due to wildfires and hurricanes, as well as a decrease in the pricing that they've received for their tax credits. So TRG met just on Monday. And so um, you got their, their recommendation today, so you may not have had a chance to review it, but the TRG does recommend um, funding them for an additional 250,000 at the same loan terms, which would be 0% repaid over, um, excuse me, 40 years. Um, TRG had one follow-up question for senior housing options to wanting just to make sure that they were contributing um, the maximum that they were able to contribute to the project. And the consultant for the project um, confirmed that they could contribute a bit more, but then it, it changed things that made it a little less financially feasible um, for the project. So, does anyone have any questions? Thank you, Molly. Graham? Yeah, I see 25 total units, uh, 21 of which are, are mirror units. It looks like they're not studios, so I assume they're missing kitchens or showers or, or something to round them out as fully sustainable units. But um, do each of those 21 count uh, one for one toward the affordable housing um, you know, initiative, you know, we have a certain number we need to, we want to hit every year. Um, is that a one for one count there? Yes, because all of the units are going to be um, below 60% of the area median income. So they do have a mix of studios and in the one bedrooms. Okay, and those are those are permanently affordable or just for the 40 year term of the loan? They are permanently affordable. Permanently affordable. Okay, great. Uh, and then my final question is, is what happens to the project if we say no? If, what happens to the project if they say, if you guys say no, they have the opportunity to go back to CHAFA, the Colorado Housing and Finance Authority, who has awarded them the tax credits to potentially see about getting additional tax credits. The consultant is reluctant to do that, um, if possible, because it's generally frowned upon by Chaffa if a project needs to come back, um, that they haven't didn't get their, their budget correct the first time around. Um, so that's what she would try and do um, if this funding didn't come through. Um, and it should be noted that they did go back to all of their other funders. Um, except for Chaffa, uh, the state uh, um, to get additional funding as well as applied and received uh, Boulder County where they cause funds as well. So they've worked at maximizing all sources. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Graham. Anybody else with questions? Molly, I had a question on the, uh, I forget the term for it, the developer, the, the, the component that was De have decreased in value the developer the deferred uh, developer fee thank you the defer can you describe that uh, i'm not sure i really understand it so as the developer of the project they will get paid i think it's about nine hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars that as the developer they will get 
And for tax credit properties, a certain percentage of it is not paid all, it's not all paid out all at once at the end of the project. So they can be repaid from the cash flow of the project over 10 to 12 years. So they get a, a certain percent each year. Okay. That's the specific fee that the TRG wanted to make sure the project was um, putting in the maximum that they could um, to contribute to the project. So the, the project, is this the developer's income fundamentally on the, on the project? Yes. Okay. So they're going to, in, in exchange for them doing the development they get this amount of income off of it, which can be over time. Mm -hmm. And how does, how does the decrease in value result in having to ask for more money? Uh, and I should find the, does, does, I think I'm not being clear. I'm wondering if- Were you talking about the decrease in the tax credit pricing, the tax credit pricing? Maybe that was it, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah so, I'm less knowledgeable <laughs> about that, but the um, the investor that they are working with at one point had the pricing was at, I think, 96 cents per dollar, and now it's down to 89 cents. So the consultant said that that was due to um, uncertainty in the market. So they are getting less for less money for the tax credits that they've been awarded by Chaffa. Okay, and you're right. It was that now that I, I found the memo, it's uh, it was the tax credits. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Catherine? So right now, I would just add this isn't uncommon. Um, we through the LHA just went through a, a rehab and refinance project at Aspen Meadows Apartments, and the initial investor actually pulled out, and we had to get a whole new investor in the middle of the project. And the amount of tax credits that we received was. Uh, slightly less. It wasn't as big of a gap, but slightly less. Um, so right now it's a more of a volatile market um, with some of the uncertainties that are happening around COVID and um, just generally increasing construction costs across the, um, the United States. So it, it's not an uncommon thing right now. It used to be, man, you could just count on and, and the prices just kept going up and up. So you had needed less and less of the other funding. That was a long uh, while ago. Good old days, we call them. Um, so this is, I just would say, it's not unique to this particular project. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I'm surprised that uh, Chapa wouldn't recognize that people couldn't anticipate wildfires that would drive up the cost of construction, but as an agency, I'm sure they have all of their own restrictions and I can understand that wouldn't be necessarily the easiest route to take. Any other questions for Molly or Kathy? No, okay, is there a motion to approve this new application as recommended by the TRG? Graham so moves, is there a second? Caitlin, any further discussion? Okay, all in favor of approving the application as recommended by TRG, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the motion passes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, Let's go back to my other computer screen now. All right, so this is the agenda item eight, discussion of potential advisory board work plan items for 2021. So I'll, I'll start this conversation. So usually, you know, what we do is, um, is, is bring forward a, a, a kind of a roadmap of activities that we schedule out throughout the year for each of our advisory board meetings. And um, 
And so, but we, and so we will do that in February, but we thought we would open it up uh, to conversation with the advisory board about what you are, um, what you are thinking. Um, some of you have had your first year under your belt. Some of you have had a few years. Kimberly's read the whole book. <laughs> so, uh, so anyhow, um, so we certainly will plug in the typical things that will come before you um, in, in terms of applications and those kinds of things. Um, you know, we also, we also started to hear some suggestions about the, um, you know, modifying or revisiting the, um, the decision-making um, matrix for, for human service agency funding. So you might wanna have an opportunity to talk a little bit more about that or other ideas that you think would be important for this advisory board to um, address and consider in 2021, in addition to your, your typical work with housing and human service agency funding applications. Mm -hmm. Alberto, did you have a comment or I thought you raised your I hand? I have ideas, but I'm going to wait. Okay. All right. All right. Caitlin and then Deanna. Um, I appreciate the opportunity for us to think about this. I think it's great. Um, I had two things that I was thinking of. And one, um, I think when we were doing, when we were doing the deliberations about funding, one of the things that came up was um, potentially changing how we, um, <coughs> Sort of put out the call for applications um, to give folks more information about um, what our key priority areas are. And so one thing um, I think might be useful is to, to get ahead of that, to think about what um, came out of that human needs assessment that we got um, sort of midway through last year to really um, be able to encourage additional applicants, for example, or more for things that are like really high priority for the city, um, rather than it just being sort of like agencies throw what they think they need and whether that program meets or doesn't meet those high, high need areas. Um, so I think it would be good to discuss that. The other thing that um, I was thinking of that I thought what might be really useful is to do something where we hear from folks who have received services from the agencies. So a lot of what we do is we talk to the agencies themselves. So we do site visits virtual or otherwise with those folks, but we don't necessarily hear from folks um, who have engaged with the agency and what their experiences are. Um, and I think that that could be really meaningful. Um, one of the reasons I say this is sometimes I hear sort of anecdotal things through social media or through friends of friends um, about people's experiences with various agencies. And it's hard to, it's hard to know like whether that's a, a real representation. Um, and I, not to say that it's not real, but I, because people experience things differently, but I think that it would be meaningful to talk to folks, um, particularly if we know um, that we're trying to address certain needs is making sure that we're actually talking to people who have those needs and whether these agencies are meeting the needs that they've expressed. Great idea, thank you, Caitlin. Deanna? Um, I was just gonna echo back to what we were talking about at the beginning in, in terms of the model that I, I really would like to spend some time developing, thinking about the model that we've been using and whether that makes sense. And, and I think that doing that at the beginning of the year when it's still more fresh in our brains probably makes sense too, because I think I will be more attuned to remembering some of maybe the concerns I had about the model that we used if we talk about it before October. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great point. Anybody else thoughts on work plan items? Ellie Berto? So I think my, my thoughts actually um, really pair well with both what Caitlin and what Deanna said. So um, I, and I wrote these down for Karen in the, I sent her a draft some ideas. Um, so one of the things I think we could do um, is in that, in that piece. So this year's, this human service needs assessment was a good human service needs assessment, but it was challenging to use it to, to really delve deeper into their priorities. 
And so one of the things I'd like to work with at work on this year, and, and I'd love to get support for the board, I got to figure out how that happens. Uh, a lot of times, mostly in the past, it feels like staff's done it and that's fine. But if there was a way to get support from the board, I would appreciate it, is to really take that human service needs assessment and think about how we engage with our community more to help, um, you know, uh, for lack of a better word, distill um, data or, or ideas that will help us or inform us better around our priority setting. So to Caitlin's point, you know, how do we engage with the folks that are receiving services? You know, um, having done this human service needs assessment, how can we engage folks saying, hey, here is what the city of Longmont has learned and how it helps us um, helps us set our priorities for our funding, you know? So just thinking about that, I think would be, would, is something that I, that I wanna work on this year. And, 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 not, and again, I'm not sure exactly how the board um, is engaged in this, um, but that's, that's, that's one thing. And then that would lead to, once we do that, then to Deanna's point, depending on what we learn and where the data leads us um, and where the input from the community leads us, then I think we use that to reevaluate the model um, to see where, you know, if the model that we've been using to Brian's earlier point, it does it have fidelity to the needs, right? Does does it does it clearly connect to the needs? And I and I I agree to a certain extent with Graham about you know ultimately you know it, it is a tool, um, but what I would say to that it it's a tool that does a couple of things. Uh, it it helps us organize our thoughts. Not that it's the end all be all. It is just a tool, but it helps us organize our thoughts and it helps us defend our decisions to a certain extent as well, because it's a formulaic process. Um, and so I think those are two key things about this tool. But again, I agree with Graham, it is a tool and we could have other tools to use. Um, so those are my, my two thoughts and I've written them down for, for Karen to, to think as well, but I just wanted to share that with the board. Thank you, Elliot Barreto. Council Member Christensen. Um, in looking over the um, Boulder County assessment, needs assessment um, on housing, um, you know, it seems to me that our, we need to do something to encourage home ownership because the, the number of people who are uh, housing or cost burdened uh, and severely cost burdened is half for people who own a home. And that would be, you know, it would be enormous if we could, we lost a lot of uh, home ownership in the meltdown of the 19, 2007, 2008. We lost a huge amount of home ownership um, through foreclosures and various other things. And if we could get some of that back, it would be an enormous help because there's nothing more in, important to the stability of a, an individual or a family than home than having a home and you're far better off if you own a home everybody knows that but not everybody can get there but what we need to do is try to figure out ways we can help people who might be able to get there get over the line so that they can get there they'll be better off their whole life if they have a home okay. thank you other suggestions, observations? Yes, Kim. Um, how often does research around best practices for interventions come into the ranking system in terms of maintaining home ownership or assisting with rental programs? Where is the money best spent? And I guess that comes through a lot of research and that evidence base results of what's working well. Is that part of the process that's been used in the past? I, I'm gonna let Karen or Ellie Barreto answer that. So, yeah, well, I'm gonna speak not to the human service agency side, even though we are, we are working to become more evaluative and data-driven on that side as well. 
But so, for example, for and I, I mentioned this during our, our orientation, I, I closely work with the R Center to look at evaluating uh, the home study program. We meet on a monthly basis. I, I get I get data from them. Um, I actually helped them create a, a, a more longitudinal survey that they didn't have at the beginning. We worked together to draft it. Um, and so, you know, th there is a, I would say that on the, on the more targeted um, funding, which is our, our housing stabilization fund and our homelessness, there is a lot of learning always happening. Um, in HSBC, we have monthly meetings that look at how we're implementing the system. Um, we are, you know, we're constantly trying to learn to improve. Um, uh, we do look at best practices, for example, diversion, when we brought that in, uh, we looked all over the country. We brought somebody from, I think, from Chicago to come and train our, our folks on that. So I would say that, yes, uh, that in that area, in, in that funding, it, it does, um, uh, we do put a lot of effort into evaluation and, and monitoring performance management. Thank you. So why don't I want to make sure everybody gets a chance here uh, or uh, is provoked to provide some feedback on this particular topic. So let's go with Graham, then we'll go to Karen Phillips and then Shakita. I'm, I'm provoked, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I like all the ideas. Um, I, I'm also wondering um, if maybe we could spend a minute talking about the uh, the city budget overall and the percentage that housing and human services takes up and then maybe just spitball or have an open conversation about you know uh, what might we be able to think about or do or suggest to council of a shifting perception around that or 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 thinking about increasing funding um, I think the that the needs assessment did support you know evidence based that uh, you know this, this area of the community needs more funding, um, you know, to support these various needs, new needs, you know, mm -hmm. um, that just magnify the issue. So maybe a conversation around that. And Graham, are you suggesting that that be a topic for this year's work plan or something that happens tonight? No, uh, this year's work plan, okay. 2020, Terrific. just, you know, on the agenda, yeah. Great, thank you, thank you. Karen Phillips? You know, I don't know if we're allowed to think about, you know, the, the homeless and the, um, you know, do we involve ourselves with that? And then the, the mental health, you know, the, the mental health and the homelessness that, that goes on. And now we have this current, the people can't live in their RVs and what, you know, can we help that out or do we work on that? Or is that just something that another agency takes care of or how do we you know, that's my concern is the hopeless and the mental health. Yeah. And that whole, you know, problem of people that don't want to do, you know, they, there are services they could go to, but they don't want to. And how do we, how do we help that out? Yeah. In this town. Okay. That, that's Thank my you. concern. Karen, Roni. So I think a, a couple things. Um, and what I wanted to, to just comment on, you know, Kim's question about best practice research. You know, I would say, um, yes, there are some areas where we do that as staff, but we don't, we don't do that on a, a broad brush level. What we do is that we ask agencies in the application to tell us um, about the best practice research that they have conducted or how is the service that they have provided align with um, best practice or promising approaches or whatever. Um, so, so we do maybe spend some selected time as staff doing best practice research. If you would like us to consider doing more or adding that into the mix, I, I, I put that on the list for discussion, but I, I did want to clarify that there are some areas where we do that. And there, um, I would say the majority of the areas, we ask the agencies to demonstrate to us how they are doing that. So, um, and then I think uh, to Karen Phillips, you know, we could, if, that, if that's a desire that we could bring back more regular updates on 
you know, on the work that we are doing in terms of homelessness prevention and intervention, you know, because a, a half of the set aside money for human service, human services is invested differently. Um, so it's, it's not something that the advisory board, you know, you don't consider individual applications and those kinds of things for funding that particular service as far as homeless uh, prevention and homeless intervention. So, um, so we certainly could look at how we make that a more regular topic or update on our, um, on our agendas so that you are more in the loop and you can provide more um, guidance and inputs. Um, I, that, that certainly seems like something we could, we could absolutely do. Great. Thank you, Karen. Shakita? I think Kathy had her hand up. Kathy, did you wanna say something? No? Oh, I'm sorry, did I miss somebody? Oh, okay. I thought she had her hand up earlier. Okay. Um, no, everyone, to me, every, everything that everyone has mentioned is really good. I think um, I agree with everything. Um, I do want to make sure that we take into account the uh, technical divide um, next year and all the challenges of these organizations have to move forward um, due to covid um, you know, new systems in place now, um, you know, all of these new changes that are totally different, um, you know, so I'm pretty sure a lot of organizations lost money because they had to put money into their business because of going virtually, um, equipment, things like that. Normally, we probably wouldn't look at, but I, I do want to make sure that we take, um, take that into effect when we think about funding for these or organizations um, next go around. Great, thank you, Shakita. My, I'll add just a little bit that's kind of massaging around some of what's already been discussed. The, uh, I really like the idea of revisiting the needs assessment. And I think what I heard and what you're describing, Eliberto, is is kind of getting a more concise idea of how that actually would best manifest in the city of Longmont or to benefit city of Longmont residents. Because to council member Christensen's point, I mean, it's one thing to say we need more housing, but is it actually more ownership or is it lower rental or, you know, what, what exactly does that mean? Um, and we've always relied, I think, not unwisely, you know, there's wisdom in relying on the agencies to provide direction, but running an agency, I'm also well aware that it's very easy to get stuck in, this is what we do, and this is how we do it, and we've always done it that way, and that doesn't mean we're necessarily adapting to what we need today. Uh, so the, giddy, the city providing some leadership on that would make sense, and I think that also does tie in to, Caitlin, what you were suggesting with you know, part of that process is kind of the gut check of, is it actually helping the people it's intended to help? And having some maybe external evaluation process, I, I also know that we have to be careful to, you know, I understand who we're talking with, what the, you know, it's like there's context to everything that happens. And I think it can be dangerous just to start pulling people and asking questions and taking everything they say at face value because we don't know what the history is, but there is a process there that makes sense uh, for sure. And I also wonder just finally, because we, we go to the city, we go to city council to ask money based for money based on the general uh, budget as a percentage. And that, that's how we have figured out how much we're getting now is because we had one negotiation already that said, hey, we should get a little bit more and we ended up to where we are, which I'm grateful for. But I also, like I was just reading that the Biden administration is proposing an additional $1.9 trillion relief package when the, there's that transition. And I wonder, 
Uh, to what extent can we, is it possible that we as an agency in this particular time with so much need can somehow support applications to some of this external funding that would come in and then be distributed to agencies for the work they do? Uh, because maybe a municipality is in a better position to receive some of that funding. Clearly, a lot of that funding is going to go from the federal to the state and down through agencies. So it's just a thought. I, I don't even know if that's a possibility. Eli Berto? Uh, we have done some of that with our the CARES Act dollars. I will say, and Kathy, I mean, Kathy knows this much more than I do. It is very complicated. <laughs> <laughs> and I am still working through this even now and learning yeah. so much as I go through this. And so, yes. And uh, I, I would say even agencies need to be careful about accepting these dollars because, you know, there's, there's a lot of strings attached when it comes to federal funding. Yeah, thank you, Kathy. Yeah, I would just add, we've been watching all the, the funding that's been coming down. And um, for instance, there's, additional funding that's uh, in the last uh, bill that was passed um, to give rent assistance or emergency rent assistance funding to communities over 200,000. So we immediately went on the attack and said, hey, why are you doing that? And how can we, you know, communities that are smaller, still have needs, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, long story short, partnered with our, the Boulder County folks, the Broomfield County folks and, um, Boulder County is actually going to get a direct allocation, which they will trickle down into the agencies and um, already have a whole system set up um, to distribute funding. So that's going to, you know, benefit our community greatly. And then we're going to partner to try and help get Broomfield um, through the state um, funding. So I would just let you know that we're keeping an eye on it and it is complicated and we're trying to, um, maximize what our community being Boulder County um, and all the communities within it get um, and to disperse mm -hmm. the funds in the easiest, quickest and most effective way possible. Even if that means we're not getting direct funding um, but it's coming down through the county or to agencies or whatever, so. Okay, thank you. I, I freely admit the naivete in, in that suggestion uh, and it also makes me think of a number of the agencies that we work with get funding from Boulder in the form of the Health Equity Fund. And as an example, one of the reasons that Boulder seems to often have money, as it's been pointed out in this board before, is because the, citizens, the residents of Boulder are willing to tax certain activities in order to generate that money. Mm -hmm. And I know that Longmont tends to be a more conservative community. There are different thoughts on uh, that process, but it seems like there's there's so much need, and and you know, I, it's just a few cents each resident, right, in order to redirect that money to the people who really need it. So maybe it's just I'm, I want to keep thinking about it, but I think I put it out there in case there's opportunities, Karen. And I think the only thing or what I'm, um, one of the things that I am gleaning from what you're saying, Brian, is that we, we have unintentionally uh, pigeonholed, for lack of a better word, um, your engagement in, in the specific funding sources that, that come, you know, to the city from, you know, from CDBG, home, affordable housing, and, and the general fund. And what mm -hmm. I'm hearing you suggest is that, you know, hey, maybe we can have a role, the advisory board, in advising, making suggestions on how, how we might invest, um, or, the, or the city, or, in, or the consortium, that we might have a role in providing some input into those other sources of funding that come in to help our community. And that and that you, Brian, and maybe others would be interested in exploring how to do that. I don't yeah. know if that would be fair. That's to, fair. Um, yeah, it's, it's just a question of, can we do more? Yeah, no. 
And, and that seems doable. Great, thank you. Uh, Karen Phillips. Yeah, I just had a question. How often do we do the needs assessment every year? No. Every five years. So things change. We, we aligned, um, we, we did one three years ago and then we hopped on with the time frame, the timing for the consolidated plan for CDBG and home funding. And so now we're on an every five year cycle, but that doesn't mean that we couldn't have some kind of interim, you know, check-in, you know, obviously for the five-year consolidated plan, mm -hmm. you know, they do an annual action plan and, um, you know, cause yeah, conditions change quickly, right. but they to do, do the, the full on assessment, we are now in a five-year cycle. Okay, thank you. And if we treated the needs assessment, something like a strategic plan, you know, where you may have a five-year strategic plan, but every year you revisit the items that fall underneath that to make sure they're still supporting the higher level goal. Uh, that would seem to make sense you know, because it may change the way it looks today versus next year at the same time. It may just be a slight nuanced difference or a dramatic difference. Uh, so maybe that can just be included in part of our planning and then rolled into the model and then we will have basically a piece of you know human software that'll be worth billions and we can sell that. You're gonna be busy this year, sounds like. <laughs> we we are gonna be busy. Yeah. Well, as busy as we possibly can manage while creating benefit. Okay, any other feedback that that any board members would like to provide or anything that staff would like specific feedback on outside of what you've received? No, I think this has a, been a really, um, a really helpful conversation and, um, and we'll do our best to synthesize it into a, a document that uh, a kind of a roadmap that we will bring back in, in February. And you can tell us whether we, you know, got it right or whether we need to okay. modify it. So thank you for the input. Great, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, okay, so we can move on to site visits. Um, we have our center, Wild Plum and Growing Gardens with our center being the, the first one up. Eliberto. So, I, you know, that that is, <laughs> So I have been in communication with the Art Center quite a bit. So it's hard to remember exactly what our site visit was. I mean, I, I, I can tell you that overall, my desk audit part of the Art Center um, went really well. Um, in other words, because the Art Center has been doing this for years, because they've, it, they've gone through our site visits, at one point they were getting a site visit every year, it seems like, as I was looking through the history. Um, um, so they've got their ducks in a row as far as documentation and all that. But my conversations with, with, with Mark have been really helpful recently. Um, actually, Madeline and I sit on the board of the Longmont Community Foundation. And this morning, Mark gave a, um, a 20, 30 minute um, update on, on what they're doing. And um, it has been quite the year for the R Center. Um, they've had many challenges. They have seen in, in, at one point in July, he said that they had seen a 500% increase in the number of folks accessing. And many of them were new, had never accessed uh, the R Center before. Um, also they have, I talked to, and I'm throwing out names that you have no idea who they are, <laughs> but, but I work with them quite a bit at the R Center. I talked to Carly and Angela, who Carly used to run the home study program. They've hired somebody new. And, and they give her a promotion, but um, but some of the trends that they're seeing is the repeat um, the repeat clients who have higher level needs for rent than they typically do. Uh, they've seen folks come in with fifteen thousand dollars in back rent. Um, so, you know, they Mark talked a little bit about they had really successful fundraising in December end of the year. They've received quite a bit of money from Kathy, for example, through CBG, CBDG, 
And um, through CARES Act as well, they receive funding for um, the uh, utility assistance. And so I guess um, overall, they are still facing challenges as far as capacity. One of that's been one of the biggest thing, not having the capacity to see folks just because of you know, the ability to hire and train. Right now, they are, Mark said this morning that they are still, they're, they're basically almost out to February before you get to see someone. Um, and that's been a challenge throughout this whole thing. And again, it's not a lack of desire to help. Um, it's, it's two things. It's one, just the overwhelming need. And two, it's the capacity of the agency. And as, even as they're trying to grow and they have hired, but it's still just the need is, is that big. So I think that's my report on the R Center. Thanks, Eliberto. Any questions for Eliberto? Uh, I, it, you know, that may be something, just that phenomenon that we see through 2021 and possibly into 2022 is just the surge of need that may, you know, may then dissipate, but how agencies are gonna deal, some of these critical agencies are gonna deal with. Same thing with the healthcare system right now, I think trying to figure out how to vaccinate hundreds of millions of people as quickly as possible. It's just this incredible spike in need. So, um, Karen, Roni. So, Eliberto, you know, I, I wonder, you know, because this, they have, uh, the R Center has had, this has been a phenomenon they've been dealing with for, for months. Um, and, and I'm just wondering how you think they have progressed in maybe a different way of thinking about how they're, they can allocate those funds, what might be an interim way of getting funds out the door. I think it is frustrating for co the community um, that there is, an, and I'm not, I am not trying to uh, judge the, the R Center, but there are hundreds of thousands of dollars that are coming in for assistance for um, individuals with rent and utilities. And, and, and to have appointments be a month out is, is really not, a, it's, it's hard to, sw to swallow as a community when we know the resources are there. So did you get a sense for what they are truly thinking about, at least in an interim way of being able to get more money out the door or we're just gonna continue same as we're doing now. We'll try to, we're, try, we're hiring on a different, you know, additional people, but we have to onboard them. It just seems like I would hope they are thinking about more um, innovative ways. It might not be their long-term plan for how they're going to continue to provide assistance, but these are really wackadoodle times. And so what might they be thinking about as a, a different way of distribution to really get money out the door more quickly? That's a great question, Karen. And we, we, and I didn't, we didn't go into that. Um, uh, but I'd be happy to follow up with Mark and the, and the team um, and, and talk about, I know that what they, they are trying to, they're trying to get as back to regular and to serve people as fast as like, so for example, they're bringing back their volunteers to, to help to try and, and, and smooth operations with their feeding programs where, you know, it won't take up so much staff time where staff can then be reassigned to do other things. Um, so I know that that's happening, uh, but they've been trying again, part because of COVID, they've been trying to be cautious and not have, you know, I, I, I got that. We all got that. And I think, and maybe we can help them because I think we say, hey, Mark, what are you going to do differently? We're going to get a same answer. So it might be that you bring together um, a, a group of folks that can help him um, just really brainstorm some, some different ideas, just kind of, you know, sit around and do kind of a what if or some out of the box, um, you know, planning, just in a way that let those let those ideas go in a free flowing way and see if anything can um, anything can stick. So I don't think it's just Mark's problem. I don't think it's just our center's problem. I think it's ours as a community to try to um, address and problem solve around and to come up with some creative ways. Again, it's not going to be the long term way they're going to do business, but 
to really help now because there is and there's more money a coming there, you know, so we should be figuring out how to get that money out. Caitlin. Yeah, uh, Karen, I, I really appreciate those comments because one of the things I was thinking about as you were asking about how they're doing it is that we also have other organizations in our community that don't have as much funding and are having to turn people away because they don't have sufficient funding and they are referring people to the Hour Center. Um, and so like, do those agencies and community organizations have capacity, for example, to do pre-screening or things that need that the hour center would need to speed up their processing of it and get the money out. Um, you know, cause I think that a lot of those, like even if they didn't have the money, if they knew that doing that could help someone that they've talked to get help faster, instead of having to start all over at the hour center, I, I can't imagine that our community partners would just be like, nope, not going to do it. Um, like, I think that they, we probably have some other folks that are, you know, overlapping with some of the things that the Hour Center does that could could assist more with that. Councilmember Christensen. Yeah, I think Caitlin's right. We have the Boulder County hub here and um, <laughs> surely they could be working together a little bit more. I know that's not traditionally what they do, but I mean, that is, everybody's supposed to be helping people. So mm -hmm. I just think that, yeah, I think that's a really good idea, Karen, to see if we can find ways to help out. Thank you. Alberto. So, so, so to Caitlin's point, we have been doing some of that. So for example, when we received some funding for uh, utility building. Um, Carmen Ramirez from our community neighborhood resources worked with um, with the R Center and, and did just what you're, what you're talking about, Caitlin, the warm handoff with some pre-screening work with folks. Um, so that, that has happened. I know that, uh, for example, the R Center worked really closely with El Comité and there were some, some challenges there, um, but they, they did make some progress. I'm not sure where it is now and we could revisit that. Um, because they were some money that El Comité received from the Community Foundation, right, the, the Knight Foundation, and, and they work with the RSR to help um, distribute those funding for rental assistance. So I think to that point, yes, we proved that it can happen. And the question is, you know, how do we, how do we broaden it? It work with the city, can it work with other partners? And, that, and that's a great question and something we can explore with the R Center. Because the other reality is, I don't know if it is already happening with other agencies because I just know what happened with the city, right? So this may already be happening with other community partners. There's a part of this that's, you know, I have, that I see almost like a crisis management plan, right? If a hurricane hits your town, it's like all the old rules kind of go out the window. And I, I think if there's some idea of this, you know, we, we bring these agencies together to create a holistic solution, a larger solution under these conditions. Uh, it may help alleviate, many agencies are gonna have a natural concern that they're losing influence. That means they're gonna lose money in the future. You know, if they start giving their money to somebody else, there's just human nature involved in all of these decisions. And, um, I, I think if there's kind of a structure where people agree to be part of this consortium to address this urgent need, maybe they'd be more willing to do so. And the other thing that occurs to me is sometimes I feel agencies need permission from funders to be innovative because it may not have been in their original application and they're concerned it's going to weigh against them come reporting time if they spent money on this extra stuff but it wasn't what they applied for. Right, any other comments? Okay, <laughs> just randomly poking around on my computer and I lost the agenda again. Wild Plum, and that would be Diana. Yes, so I think this will be a less in-depth conversation than our center. Um, so I saw, uh, did a site visit in October for Wild Plum, which now seems like it was 10,000 years ago, even though it was only a couple months. So I had to look over my notes because I barely remember it. But essentially Wild Plum 
um, works with low income families for early childhood education. They have an early Head Start program and a Head Start program. Um, they take a pretty comprehensive approach. So it's not just a preschool or um, educational program. They have, they work with their, the families that come in to do like health and dental screenings. They work on mental health issues. They work on nutrition referrals. They work on getting them hooked up with um, rental assistance or whatever they need. They have a really cool thing that they do cool. They have a really cool thing that they do called a policy council where they have um, their board is advised by um, a council that's comprised entirely of parents that um, have children in their, in their program. So I think that helps really diversify how they are approaching um, the work that they do. Um, it did seem like in terms of successes that they have some, some great successes there and that when the kids come into the programs, 60% of them are ranked as near expectation levels. But by the time they complete the programs, 90% of the kids are meeting expectations and are, are better, to, much better equipped to be starting kindergarten. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions, but you know, good organization. Great, thank you, Deanna. Eliberto? So on the desk audit side of that, um, you know, Wild Plum is a is a Head Start is a federally recognized Head Start. So of course, their documentation is. I wasn't going to read through all of the federal requirements that they have. That would take me, you know, it's it's about the same size as the binder that Kimberly read through. So, um, so I, I really applaud Kimberly for going through that whole thing. Uh, but. I do want to point out the policy council. The, the, the important piece of the policy council in my mind for, for this group is, is how much it values the people who it serves, right? So the policy council is made up of parents who have children in, um, in, um, in the agency. We did talk about, you know, um, serving, you know, diversifying who it serves the majority of, of of children it serves are latinos um and so we there was conversations about serving others as well and i think they're they're you know uh they took that and they're and they're gonna they want to try and diversify who they serve um so yeah i just want to say the policy council is really important and then I, one more thing on the other side that i forgot to mention be, that's similar to the policy council you know mark's done a good job of diversifying the board they now have three people of color on the um, the R Center board, um, and so that that is a, 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 a uh, including Latinos, African Americans as well, and so I think just to give them credit for that work as well that they have. Um, but yeah, I think the policy council piece is really important for our work around diversity and equity at, at the leadership level. Great, thank you, Eliberto. Any questions for Diana or Eliberto? On wild plum. No, okay. Thanks, Diana. Thanks for the good report. And growing gardens, Shakita. Yeah, I don't have my notes either, but it was a pretty short meeting. Um, of course, they have challenging, you know, challenges as being a garden. And normally they have a program. Well, let me start off. I know it's they serve multi-generational. So of course they're volunteers um, of all ages, but they have programs for teenagers and they also have programs for elementary school kids um, and the volunteers. They have the teenager program. They usually have them as volunteers um, as well. So of course they are not able to do that during COVID and they used to go into the schools and they're not able to do that during COVID. So um, it's been a very challenging year for them. Um, and they did just hire a bilingual uh, employee to help them. Um, she was very excited about that. Um, they used to send home um, plants with the kids when they would come and volunteer, uh, they would send home plants to the parents for them to take home. Um, when they would go to the school, they provided snacks. Um, 
And um, so, yeah, there are no like field trips and things like that. All of that is on halt. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's um, it's very unfortunate because the, they also have a, um, a, a garden at the YMCA in Longmont. And so that I remember that that food actually goes to the Hour Center, speaking of the Hour Center, I believe. Um, and so that food where families can, um, it's also free to the families as well for low income families. So um, it was a very short visit. Um, Eliberta, what am I missing? No, I, I think you got all that right. On, on the desk audit side, so for Kimberly, so Kimberly just as, so um, we didn't talk a little about in the orientation. So the board members on their side of the, of the site visit is much more just what you heard from Chiquita and what you heard from Deanna, learning more about the organization, their work, what they're doing, what they're accomplishing. My side of the site visit is much more formal site visit where I actually look at their bylaws, at their employee and board manuals, um, and I ask questions if I, you know, if I have concerns or if they're missing things. Most of the time, more of your well-established agencies aren't missing anything because, like I said, they've gone through these before. They know what they need, et cetera. When it came to growing gardens, though, they were missing a couple of significant things. Um, and I, I, I talked to them about it. So one thing they're missing, um, even though they have invested in their in, in a, a consultant to it, they, they call it JEDI, which is, let me see, um, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion work. Um, they didn't really have a really strong board nominating process. Um, so, you know, that that's really important to the board because if you don't have that, it becomes more of a who you know, like you just invite people that you know, and that's fine. But if you have a strong board nominating process that maybe looks at characteristics or skill sets or et cetera, it can help you get a stronger board. And so they're going to work on that. And then the other big thing they didn't have uh, as I looked through it is they really have no grievance process for clients or employees. Um, so I said, you know, that, that, that's an issue. You wanna have a way for your employees or your clients that if they have a concern that they feel safe to voice it. Uh, and so that was two deficiencies that I found. Um, and so they're, 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 they told me they're gonna be working and we'll check in with them um, next year and say, hey, or whenever our, whenever our scheduled, um, um, site visit happens again to see if they address those issues. Cause we save these, I save these desk guys. I can go back and look. I've looked at stuff that Karen's done in the past and followed up. And so that was what I found with, with growing gardens. They really, they just didn't have these things. And I think they're important to have. Oh, one last thing where we decide why they're important is because we look at the uh, Colorado nonprofits, um, forget what the name of it is, Karen, the best practices and it's principles and practices of nonprofit right. management. So we take these from that, that, that is brought together by the Colorado Nonprofit, Colorado nonprofit Association and they, and they put that out every year or not every year, but it feels like every couple of years they get a new edition out there, so. And the board members have that in the manual that you got when you came on yeah. board, a copy so. of that. And it has, it gets updated every few years. Yeah, so that's my report on growing gardens. Great, thank you. Thank you, Shakita. Any questions for Shakita or Eliberto? No? All right. Well, we'll probably finish early today then. Uh, we are at the last agenda item outside of other business, which typically doesn't happen, uh, which is the election of the chair and vice chair for 2021. So before we go into that, I just want to, as my last comment, because I think upon the election, the new chair will, will take over the meeting. Um, I, it, I have really, really enjoyed being chair of this board and working with you all. It's, it's been uh, an absolute pleasure. And of course, I'll continue to be here, but I'll just needle the chair now instead of doing it from this point of view. And um, you're really all awesome. So I'm, I'm grateful and humbled. So are there uh, nominations for the chair and vice chair? 
Okay, so I would like to nominate Caitlin as chair and Graham as vice chair. Uh, are Caitlin and Graham open to accepting those nominations? Caitlin's good, Graham's good. Okay, is there anybody else who would like to self-nominate? Okay, I'd, I'd like to self-nominate. Just I put, can I run another term? No, I don't think so. Okay, all right, I'm out of the running then. You had to take a year off, according to the bylaws. I think it'll be more than that. Um, Okay, terrific. So we will now have a vote. Um, Brian, sorry, I don't think you got nomination. a second. I think you made a nomination. We need a second, and it looks like you, you have a second. I'll second. Okay, Karen, I don't know that I can make a nomination as a motion as chair. So I can make a nomination. The right mayor there. does. <laughs> So I think we're going to go with you. You made the nomination and, and Deanna said Okay, it. terrific. We'll, All right, we'll if everybody's that. good with that. Uh, any discussion? Okay, everybody in favor of having Caitlin as chair and Graham as vice chair, please signify by raising your hand. Okay, any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion passes and we now have our new chair and vice chair, congratulations. And I now turn the meeting over to you, Caitlin. Um, some fairly big shoes to fill here, Brian. Thank uh, you for your, your okay. uh, chairmanship this year. Um, I feel like um, I know as a newer board member, this it was helpful to see you um, and your questions and engaged um, throughout the year in everything that we were doing. So super appreciative of that. And also the, the trust that you just handed um, here. So uh, I guess- Well placed, Caitlin. I guess then um, if, is there any other business that we need to, yes, Karen. So I, I will be quick. So just to just to clarify that we do have an open position on the advisory board. So we had a little bit of a communication snafu uh, because, you know, Jake's resignation came in. It's a, you know, he, he resigned before his term ended. And, um, and so when it came time to make the final um, appointments, uh, we didn't have the the right number of openings that we had, so uh, we did not fill Jake's position. It seemed like we had an adequate. Um, we've been doing pretty well with quorums, and so we're going to hold um, that open until we do the mid year. There's a mid year recruitment that usually starts in I don't know April. The, it's it's a June appointment, so that's when we will appoint our open and, and unexpired advisory board term. And the other thing that I would recommend is that, um, you know, the, the city clerk's office will advertise in, in the typical ways that they do um, in terms of posting on the website, blah, blah, blah. But I would say that this, uh, it's, it's never too early to start thinking about, talking about, um, and, and suggesting that people that you know in your networks or that you might meet that they might consider uh, submitting an application for this advisory board. Um, and then just a second quick announcement and we'll probably bring back, bring back more, um, a more detailed update is that the, um, the Lamont City Council as of January 5th is now the board of commissioners for the Lamont Housing Authority. And so we are continuing to formalize some changes uh, that um, based on work that we have been doing in partnership with the housing authority for a good part of 2020. So the, and, and the housing, the, the current, the former members of the Lamont Housing Advisory Board have now become 
a new city advisory board that advises city council. So now we have a Longmont Housing Authority advisory board. In addition to a Housing and Human Services advisory board. So that was also part of a change that was made in, on January 5th. And um, so the current members of the, the, the previous members of the advisory of the Housing Authority Board are now um, a five person advisory board to city council on Lamont Housing Authority matters. So, so we don't know how much, so the, the, the thought that Kathy and I had and discussed for some time down the road in the future is might there be a possibility of, of um, you know, combining, you know, that housing and human services would also could have a role in advising around Longmont Housing Authority matters. That's down the road. So just some, you know, and we might decide that would be the worst thing ever, but, you know, it's just something to, to contemplate. But we'll come back with more specific updates about the housing authority changes. This isn't the last of the changes that probably will be happening. And that's all that I have, Caitlin. Okay, thanks, Karen. Um, any other business that folks have? If not, we can entertain a motion to adjourn. Diana, do I have a second? Shakita, thank you all. See you next month. Bye. Ryan, thanks for being such a great chair. Yeah, really. you've been great. Yeah. Oh, thank you. It's been a pleasure. See you all. Have a, have a wonderful month, as Madam Chair said. Bye. Bye.